Uh, so first, uh, we're going to present the Innovator Award. Uh, this award is uh, awarded to a business that has dedicated itself uh, to inclusion and removing barriers by creating an accessible space for patrons with disabilities and or fostering inclusive hiring and accommodation practices to help people with disabilities realize their passion and potential. Uh, the recipient of this award was nominated by Mitch and Dave Lawson. Um, I just want to say thank you. Um, I believe wholeheartedly that um, that we need to have, make sure that our businesses reflect our communities, and that is important for, for sure for me, that the kids that we support see that they have all the potential to be fully employed in their community, so it's important to me that we employ people with lots of diverse backgrounds and skills and abilities, um, and we can find a way to make it successful for anybody. So thank you for recognizing us, and we certainly appreciate this day. Next, we present the Collaborator Award. This is presented to a community group that has made a difference in the lives of people with disabilities through acceptance and equal opportunity. Um, this year's recipient embodies that completely. Um, nominated by Renee Jacobs. This group provides support for students and community members with disabilities and has been coming together to create inclusion for many years. This group has committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment at the University of Lethbridge. They demonstrate to other students and the community, people with disabilities have just as much to offer as anyone. Can we get the representative for the Students' Union from the U of L? I just wanted to thank you for this great honor. Um, it's really awesome to see all your faces. Whoever does come around to the Students' Union, um, you always put a smile on our faces when you come by. And yeah, thank you so much. Uh, next up is the Supporter Award, uh, which is presented to an individual who has ha been a strong ally of people with disabilities and their success through advocacy and encouragement. The committee has received several nominations in this category. Uh, the community shared wonderful, touching stories of people with and without disabilities working and thriving together. Uh, the recipient, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so we'll have the nominator come on up, which I believe is Gwen Rowley, and she's gonna say a few words. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm very honored to uh, nominate my husband, Vern. I feel that Vern is an amazing husband who will drop everything to help people. For example, Vern gives transportation to people that need it. He helps people in our church move in and out, and they move quite a bit, so he's always willing to go out and help. He works out at our, where I ride, or riding barn, and uh, he always works extra hours when Maureen needs it. He helps set up events and is always volunteering to help. He does this all on top of a part-time job, and I'm happy for my husband to be recognized today. He always says, I don't do things for awards, but I say it's good to be recognized once in a while. Congratulations, Vern. Mm. I'm allowed to kiss. <laughs> The Champion Award is awarded to an individual with a disability who has, been, who has distinguished themselves through personal or professional excellence, creating a positive impact on the community with their attitudes and efforts. Uh, the Champion was nominated by Lillian Westling. If you could come up and... I'm very proud to have nominated this person. Um, I'm very proud to have nominated this person. I spent 45, 47 years with him. So, I know a lot about what he did. I nominated him because when he started out, he was just like every other kid going out there trying to find a place in the world, and there was no place in the world for him. So he started off by creating a place among the bowlers as the first YBC bowler. He went and continued on until he became an advocate, and he created a space for people with special needs to have a chance to bowl among the ranked bowlers, and he bowled against the top men in, in Lethbridge. He became a coach, which opened up the doors 
for other individuals to become coaches, and several of them have become coaches. This, my son, Bill, has done a number of things. He was one of the people who went to the university to do a dance program, and while he was at the dance program, he created his own volunteer situation by going to the Salvation Army and saying, I need something to do three days a week. You want me? I'm here. And they took him. And they still have him. <laughs> Without this young man, I would never have created the programs that I have created, and it's because of him that there are some of the bold programs in town and around town and out of town that you can go to. Bill is has been very self-sufficient and gone a long way, and if that's not an example of what all of you can do, all of you, then I don't know what is because he's done a lot of this. Even though my husband says I pushed him along the way, he's done a lot of this by himself. So it is now time for the final award of the afternoon. Uh, this is the Community Compassion Award uh, recipient is chosen by the IDPD committee itself. It is awarded to a predetermined local citizen who has made a substantial difference in the lives of others through caring, acceptance, and giving back. Uh, past years, recipients were Bonnie Greenshields, Mary Dick, Daryl and Lisa uh, Madorm Zoruma, yeah, Pat Robb, and Dave Lawson. And so actually, I was the one who nominated the committee here, so I have a few words to say. <laughs> so this year's winner uh, is an incredible person who is the embodiment of com the Community yeah. Compassion Award. Uh, she recently hit the 10-year milestone in her work at the Southern Alberta Individualized Planning Association. The milestone prompted me to nominate her for the award, as in my two years working with her, she has continually impressed me with her dedication, knowledge, and self selflessness through her work with self-advocates, community groups, and numerous individuals across Southern Alberta. Her work with SARSAN is also the gold standard for the support and dedication our community deserves. She is a resource that people trust and value, including myself, when I need advice and guidance. I know she does not do this work to be publicly recognized, but I believe it is important to do so once in a while. Congratulations, Anna. You truly deserve this award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Um, yeah, I I don't really know what to say except for, for thank you. I um, I don't do this job for recognition. I, I I do this job because it's my passion and I love what I do. Um, and I feel like I get way more out of this job than I ever give. And so I thank you for the people that have um, come into my life as part of this job. The many advocates and allies and support staff and organizations and the community at large that I get to work with every single day is what keeps me doing the work that I do um, now. So, thank you. And that brings the fifth annual Lethbridge Inclusion Awards and Inter International Day of Persons with Disabilities to a close. Thank you to everybody who attended the event, once again making it a success. We look forward to continuing this wonderful uh, afternoon of recognition for years to come. Thank you everyone for coming out today, I really appreciate it. I'm Cassie Dirksen, Shaw Spotlight Junior Reporter, and today I'm here with Diane, who who works with um, Le Volunteer Lethbridge. Today we are at Park Place Mall with Volunteer Lethbridge Gift Wrapping Station. 
Diane is going to teach me some tips and tricks on how to wrap gifts. And I really do hope that it doesn't require me getting any paper cuts. Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> we'll work on that for sure. <laughs> Maybe I'll get the paper cut. <laughs> Hopefully nobody gets one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what services does Volunteer Lethbridge offer at the gift wrapping station? At the gift wrapping station, we provide gift wrapping service plus coat and parcel check. So people can drop off their coats or their parcels and continue shopping. And by donation, we'll keep, keep their coats and parcels for them until they're finished. And then we do the wrapping. So we have, you can see here, just a few different sizes of packaging that we offer. And so each, each size is a different price. So we do a lot of, the biggest thing I've ever wrapped is a treadmill. So it covered the whole table, so that was a tough one to wrap. Why do you offer gift wrapping? We offer gift wrapping as a customer service to Park Place Shopping Centre, but also as a fundraiser for Volunteer Lathbridge. So it, it helps us raise money for the different programs and services that we have through Volunteer Lathbridge. Um, how many years have you done this, have you done this fundraiser? This is our seventh year of wrapping presents here. Um, how long does it run for each year? It goes from just after Santa arrives. So November 18th was our first day, and we go right till December 24th at 5 o'clock. Diane, can you show me how to wrap a Christmas present, please? Sure, I can do that for you. Let's find uh, one, and well, we, you can pick out the paper. All right, let's get started. get involved if they're interested in it that there's they can bring their presents by for wrapping so we do individual wrapping but we can also wrap for businesses or corporations for staff gifts and different things so they can bring their gifts to us and we can wrap them for them if people want to volunteer they can give us a call at volunteer Lathbridge at 403-332 4320 to sign up for some volunteer shifts um, what is your personal favorite part about about being involved in this? About seeing all the people that come together to help make it happen. Because there's over 200 people that volunteer their time to do the gift wrapping for us. So some of them wrap in very creative ways. So you always learn something new. You always learn new tips and tricks to wrap presents. Thank you, Diane, for helping us learn how to wrap gifts and learn more about Volunteer Lethbridge. Happy Holidays!
As the cold weather settles in for the winter, citizens of Lethbridge, including students at Lethbridge College, are getting ready for the holiday season. For too many, some do not have access to the food they need to feed themselves and their families. Last year, the Lethbridge College Students Association Food Bank saw one of its busiest years ever. So far this school year, LCSA Food Bank organizer Angela Fretz Waters says that the food bank has only seen about 12 users per month. Right now it's a different year. Um, I've had about 12 users per month. Uh, last year we had one of our highest years yet since I've been here. Fritz Waters says changes to the provincial post-secondary education budget have students worrying about more than tuition and books. She adds students are turning to food banks for assistance. With the recent changes to the budget that the government made, it may increase in the, se in the second semester. Uh, and then going forward, I think we will see an increase if, um, if students are coming to school. They're, they're going to need that extra help. Off campus, the Lethbridge Food Bank is also expecting a busy holiday season. Organizers say the food bank is always looking for donations. Everything from peanut butter to pasta and cash. We need like cereal, peanut butter, uh, canned meat, pasta, pasta sauce, meal in a can and a bunch of other things. In 2019, there was just under 25 million pounds of food donated to food banks across Canada. And it's not just the unemployed and homeless receiving help. According to the Impact Report of 2019 for Food Banks Canada, one in six Canadians who access food banks is gainfully employed, and over 800,000 use a food bank each month. Organizers of the food bank also say that there is people and families that are in need of help, which means that the food banks need more and more donations for the holiday season and beyond. For E! News, I'm Joshua Schooning. My name is John Chiefcalf. I'm the FNMI District Coordinator for Lethbridge School District. Um, yesterday we did an event at uh, Indian Valley Park and we took the entire staff. One of the main purposes for that activity was how do you, where is your starting point uh, looking for an Aboriginal perspective? So what we decided to do is we decided that Let's go into nature. Let's take the human element out of it. And just question and observe how nature cooperates. And where is the evidence in that process? And discussions like how ant hills, how ants work together, how if there's like a hundred deer, after the 51st deer, we'll look at the same watering hole, they'll, they'll all get up and leave. Uh, how birds fly in perfect unison in groups, and uh, again, fish. Um, we talked about weather patterns. Uh, Blackfoot basically has two, near, two new years, spring, where oxygen levels increase, uh, fall, where oxygen levels decrease. So the earth takes a huge breath. So in a different sense, if we were to look at nature as an intelligent system, that is an Aboriginal lens. And now we can come together as a group and explore how that would work in curriculum, activity, ba activity learning, uh, how do you co-create resource crits from an Aboriginal lens perspective, and really, really start the discussion on how we can work together collaboratively and how the two can mingle and cross over finding commonalities but also finding uniqueness and insights and looking at perspectives like the perspective of an eagle or looking at the moon and the sun identifying how the weather is going to be in the next two or three days looking at when you see a coyote and it's still warm outside but the fur is becoming thick which means that winter is around the corner so having discussions about ecolo ecological processes, educational processes, and how does that fit. One, one of the things that we did out in the, it, from an Aboriginal perspective, there is an investment process of trying to understand ceremony, but there are other ways to connect to the land. So one of the ways that we connected through the land was through a Tai Chi exercise. So the whole component is 
You, what you're doing is you're breathing in positive energy from the earth and then breathing out your negative toxins from your body. And there is a, a meditative process that goes with that. And so when you think about it, what we did was sort of a, uh, what's called raising chi, raising energy from the land and then breathing out a cleansing of breathing through the body and the cleansing of energy um, of the body, the energy that surrounds the body. And then um, pretending to be like a tree and swaying in the tree as a form of relaxation. And all the participants, the teachers, connected to the land. So that initiated a starting point, a starting point of creativity and inquiry. Because that philosophy, um, from what I understand, is similar to Blackfoot philosophy, where it is a circular way of interpreting, not a left to right process. I'm a hometown girl, born and raised in Lethbridge, Alberta. I am a first generation low income student. I went to the University of Lethbridge. I lived on a farm just on the south side of Lethbridge, just right up against the edge of Lethbridge, now called Tudor Estates. I lost my father when I was uh, 16, and I lost my mother when I was 23, and the world kept falling behind me. And so I had to develop the courage and the resilience to move forward, and that's when I decided to go and pursue a master's. At the time, I was hoping my brothers would talk me out of this insanity, you know, going across country to chase another pipe dream, but they didn't and I, I stepped forward and that was the best decision of my life. Katrina is a researcher who focuses on physical activity behavior, but she very specifically researches walking behavior, which is really unique but also very important because it's a behavior that everyone engages in and we know that it can have huge implications to population health. So her work really does shape a lot of our understanding of how physical activity can benefit the health of the population. So I study walking behavior. Specifically, I'm interested in step counting and cadence tracking. And step counting is very popular nowadays with all sorts of wearable technologies. And if you've ever heard how many steps per day you should take, that's my foundational research. We're increasingly sedentary, and we're packing on the pounds, and our bodies are just not equipped to be so still all the time. We're getting aches and pains and so on. So being physical activity is fundamental to our well-being. And to me, walking is the fundamental fundamental activity behavior that we all want to try and, and engage in. I found the thing that I could invest in most in myself was my brain and my intellect. I found that I had capacity there and I started realizing that was the thing that, that was going to help me achieve my dreams and I just kept this renewing my passion and reinventing myself and pursuing the, uh, the next level. It is the students that I've produced, the mentoring I've done, that's where my pride comes from. I can look back and say, oh yes, I achieved this award, I've done these talks, I've gone to South Korea, I've, I've gone to Germany, I've done all these wonderful things and I have friends around the globe now. But my greatest joy has been the, the students and the postdocs and the assistant professors that I've helped to lift up and see them achieve and succeed and uh, help them get the awards and help them get the jobs. That's, that's the true joy. Hi, we're here today with Lauren Warnica, a respiratory therapist here at the Tabor Clinic. And just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you yeah. do. So my name is Lauren. I'm the respiratory therapist here in Tabor. So I do the Tabor Clinic and I do the Tabor Hospital and kind of all of the respiratory patients in the community as well. So I do outpatient testing, which is what this Holter Monitor is, is what we're talking about today. Um, I do breathing testing, do the heart testing, um, do blood testing, things like that, and pretty much anything respiratory related, I do it. Excellent. So uh, we're, we're wanting to talk about the Holter Heart Monitors. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what they do and, and who they help. Sure, so it's this guy here. Um, I do have two of them. These are our brand new machines. So what they do, the Holter, 
uh, Holter heart rate monitor, basically what it is. Um, there's some stickers that go on your chest and the point of the testing is the patient will wear it for 24 hours, so a whole day. Um, and as they're wearing it, this little guy, this little machine here is collecting information about their heart electricity. Um, and all that information, once they bring it back to me and I collect it, I send it to an internal medicine doctor in Lethbridge. So it goes, gets gone through by a specialist um, looking for any abnormalities, anything that maybe they need to, they might be interested in or maybe that they need to be fixing or things that they can maybe be tweaking for that patient. So why is this an important piece of equipment here in Tabor? Yeah, um, it's very important because especially in a rural area, you don't have easy access to an internal medicine doctor who specializes in heart problems and heart issues like that. So this monitor allows us to gather information and also get it sent to the right doctor in Lethbridge um, for it to be gone through and any anything that maybe might be missed by a family doctor or, or they don't see all the time an internal medicine doctor would look through. So it's important that we have that access to the internal medicine doctors for all the patients in Tabor. So why did respiratory therapy come to the foundation to ask for this piece of equipment? Yeah, so these are actually new. We just got these in the last year or two um, and when these were kind of rolled out, um, Alberta Health Services, they only gave me one and we had one for a while and we were running like a six to eight week wait list to even get the monitor put on. So it was quite timely and people that really, really needed it didn't have the access to it that they should have. And with only having one, we weren't able to do anybody that was in the hospital that needed one. We weren't able to do that because we were fully booked for almost two months. Yeah, so with the extra monitors, it's been great. We can um, do patients in the hospital. We can do any emergency urgent ones that need to be done. We can get them in quicker. And then we're also able to do the 48 hour Holter monitors where they wear them for, instead of one day, it's two days. Yeah. So obviously this um, heart monitor certainly helped you in your role here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's helped a lot of my patients, help them get to the right doctor, get them any medical conditions that they have maybe sorted out quicker than they would have without it. Awesome. Yeah. So in your opinion, what is the most important role or work that the Tabor and District Health Foundation does? I think it's they, the role that they have in, in their community and kind of sorting out what's most important for the patients in the community. Um, Alberta Health Services, they do their best, but they're such a big organization, sometimes they kind of lose what that specific town needs, whereas the foundation, they can tell, and they are working with the patients every day, and they they live in the community, so they know what they need. Excellent. And so you would agree, then, that it's important to to support the TDHF in, in their role in the community. Yeah, definitely, because without your support, without everyone else's support, I would not have these monitors, and all the patients that I've put these monitors on wouldn't have them either. Thank you for your time, Lauren. Yeah, no problem.